All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the panel on economic and security audits, do's and don'ts. Uh, I'm Guido Molinari. I'm the managing partner at Prison Group. I'm going to be moderating this panel. And over the next 30, 45 minutes, we're going to try to dive into both, you know, what are security audits, what are economic audits, do's, don'ts. Uh, we have on stage uh, two people from very high profile projects that have gone through these processes and we have uh, an expert on, on security audits. I'm gonna try to bring in a little bit of knowledge on the economic, on the economic side. Um, and just as a you know, starting question, I'm just gonna ask each member of the panel to introduce themselves and maybe you know, share uh, a little bit about you know, their company and what they look forward for 2020 in the industry. Uh, then maybe you wanna give it a go. Yeah, sure. Hey, uh, I'm Dan Guido, the CEO and co-founder of Trail of Bits. We're a software security research and development firm with specialized practices for blockchain and cryptography, among other areas. Uh, we have about 50 people, but approximately 20 of those work in this space. Uh, we've been doing it for about three years, and I've worked with dozens and dozens of firms uh, that are developing decentralized applications. Um, what I'm excited about for 2020 is I think that we've laid the foundation in terms of knowledge and tools to actually correctly implement a lot of the smart contracts that people depend on. And in 2020, I see developers being capable of using those in more places and being aware that they exist, uh, hopefully making my job easier to think about more kind of incentive model and economics issues uh, so that people can be sure that their applications work as intended and not just um, are implemented correctly. Thank you, Dan. Jude? Hi, my name is Jude Nelson. I'm an engineering partner from Blockstack PVC. Uh, I've been there for a few years now. And we at Blockstack work on, um, well, first of all, who's ever seen Silicon Valley, the TV show? So season five about the blockchain, that's basically us. We're, we're producing a new model for building decentralized applications where users own their data and it's end-to-end -end encrypted, nobody can see it except for you, and it has similar performance characteristics and similar ease of development to the conventional web. And the thing I'm most excited about for 2020 is the increasing evolution from Web 2 towards Web 3, where users um, gain, start, to, start to reap in mass the uh, enhanced privacy and security benefits that we've all been building for the past several years as a community. Thank you, Jim McLean. Hi everyone, my name is McLean Wilkinson. I am one of the co-founders of New Cipher. Uh, New Cipher is a cryptography company and we build privacy preserving um, technologies and infrastructure uh, and encryption algorithms or encryption libraries. Um, our primary product is the New Cipher network, which is a decentralized network that provides uh, secrets management and access controls to decentralized applications and to other decentralized protocols. Uh, for 2020, um, obviously the big thing that we're most excited about is pretty much to kick things off. Uh, our main net should be going up um, very early in the year, so that'll be sort of the, the really big milestone for us. Um, and then sort of in parallel to the network, uh, we do a lot of longer term research around fully homomorphic encryption and privacy preserving smart contracts, uh, and we'll start to push out um, a lot of that uh, next year. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Dan. Um, the title of this panel is Economic and Security Audits. You guys are, you know, one of the most known security firms working in blockchain, as you mentioned, dozens and dozens of projects. Uh, but I know, you know, knowing you personally, that you don't like the word audits when you think about the work you guys do with, with projects. Uh, can you tell a little bit about that, why the word audit and what you guys use instead and what, what is the reason behind this? Sure, yeah. So we shy away from the word audit because it feels fairly reductive for what we actually provide and what companies really need. Um, when I think about an audit, I think about the payment card industry, PCI, data security standard, DSS, PCI DSS, which, you know, there's many, many firms out there that are PCI DSS compliant, and they have networks that have been surveyed by companies like, let's just say, Trustwave, uh, but do horrific things with the data that you give them and end up getting breached and lose all their data. Um, that kind of like checklist style adherence to a minimum viable security program is not what decentralized applications need and really just describes us providing you a list of bugs as the relationship between my firm and our clients. That's not what we offer, right? What companies need instead is primarily they need education because 
A security firm is not going to be around 12 months out of the year while you're writing code. We need to make sure that the performance of your team to do things securely improves after we leave. That's really difficult to measure in terms of an audit. Um, we also need to figure out things like the specific problems you're trying to solve. Uh, you know, if, if I was referring to these kinds of reviews as audits, then I would say, you know what, check, no integer overflows. But as economists and folks that are worried about crypto economics, you know that just because an application doesn't have integer overflows doesn't mean it's safe. So we have to think beyond that, and that's why we consider security review or security assessment a much more accurate description of what we're trying to provide and what companies need. Thank you, Dan. Um, so now um, thinking about you know, security assessments or reviews and um, you know, Jude and McLean, you guys have gone through multiple ones. Uh, why is security a key factor in, you know, in your project, in the industry in general for, for blockchain applications? And you know, when were you thinking about, okay, we're gonna go through this process, was this at a certain specific point in the timeline of your project? And you know, what were the, your criteria for feeling, okay, we're ready to, to engage in this type of review of what we've been doing? Uh, Jude, if you wanna give it a go. Uh, yeah, sure. So blockchains are kind of a unique distributed system category in that they are far less forgiving than the other ones when it comes to mistakes. Blockchains aren't like websites, right? Like you make a mistake on your website, you just push a new version, and you know, everything is still fundamentally okay, the sun will set and rise, and no one's gonna be asking for a head on a pike or anything like that. This is not the world that we live in with blockchains. Blockchains cannot forgive, and they cannot forget. That's the social contract. Like, there's no difference between fraud and a mistake. So if there's a bug in your blockchain that causes somebody to get tokens when they shouldn't have, or takes away somebody else's tokens, well, you're in big trouble. You just hurt somebody, or a lot of somebody's and the remediations aren't that good. Um, sometimes it'll involve crashing the network, sometimes it will involve forking, sometimes it will involve trying to roll back history, and, and there's a lot of reasons why all of those will lead to kind of messy outcomes that leave nobody happy. So the only real viable solution here is to get it right the first time. But of course, nobody ever gets it right the first time. No one can write bug-free code. So it's absolutely crucial that you get security reviews early, as early as you can. Like as soon as you have a minimum, as soon as you know what your functional specs are, as soon as you know what, like you see the light at the end of the tunnel and you know what the blockchain's gonna be doing, that's when you should start talking to your auditors. And it's important not just to consider just the low-level things like, you know, no integer overflows, um, but also consider the more holistic picture. Like, and this is something that Prism really excels at, not only ensuring that the system will work as intended, but the economics and the behaviors of the actors that partake in running this system, that their incentive aligns to keep your system running in the face of people who would try to crash it. So it's super important to make sure that you uh, iterate on this as much as you can before you launch, because there are no second chances. McLean, you have you to add? Yeah, I, I echo a lot of what you said like in you know, blockchain and decentralized networks, particularly if it's actually decentralized, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to push up uh, a, a fix or a short, like a very sort of quick security fix to something. Uh, it's not like a website where you can, you have control of the server, you just push up a fix and then you're good. Um, you know, if something goes wrong, um, theoretically everything is immutable and you can't really fix it after the fact. Um, the other sort of fairly unique thing about this space is that very, very early on in a project or a, a network's life, um, they could be facilitating a very significant amount of economic value. Um, you have projects that are a few months old, you know, they're a DeFi project and you know, tens of millions of dollars are going through these contracts and it's, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, that's obviously pretty catastrophic. It's not quite the same, you know, if you're you know, a month-old startup, typically you don't see these same kind of sort of economic values going through these contracts. Um, when we were looking at, or thinking about having security audits done, our sort of guiding principle was to do it early and often. Um, you know, so I, I think to, to Jude's point, as soon as you have something that's, you know, relatively uh, functional um, and is actually worth, it's, it's worth engaging early with an auditor, uh, we've done several rounds of security audits. Um, obviously, there's sort of a tension between you know, having someone look at something too early when it's still moving very quickly. Um, that makes it obviously, it's a moving target, it's harder to audit. Um, but uh, I do think there's a lot of value um, in engaging early. Thank you, guys.
guys, and this is working, okay. Um, then to add to what you know, McLean and Jude mentioned, you, you must have talked to you know, hundreds of prospects, you know, many, many firms that are considering, you know, should we do a secure review now, or should we wait? What are your recommendations as, as, a, you know, as the other party in this engagement in terms of like, should they go ahead and start or is it better to wait? Are there sort of specific points that, okay, you're in the sweet spot, this is when you should do it? Sure, yeah, it's never too early. And I think what people do is they build up, uh, or rather they're not aware of all the opportunities they have in their development process to start building security in. So they build it up to one enormous monolithic security review as the only thing, as their only option, right? And then they lean on uh, challenges like what McLean mentioned, that the code's churning very quickly, uh, you're constantly redeveloping or implementing new components, and you think that you're never quite ready, so the project with, say, Trail of Bits gets pushed off later and later and later and later to your own detriment. So let me describe a couple of the opportunities that are available to anyone to start this process earlier, sometimes at no cost. Um, first off, uh, Trail of Bits embeds all the knowledge we have about smart contract development into open source tools that we publish. Uh, we have a tool called Slither, it's a static an analyzer that you can just run on your code and get some feedback that you wouldn't otherwise have that uses techniques and uh, vulnerabilities that our own team has discovered on reviews on, uh, fr from our clients. On the other hand, we also have opportunities like our office hours. Uh, every other week, we just let anybody who wants to show up on a Google Meet with us and chat with us for an hour. Um, so beyond those two things, we can also scope projects into shorter length, quicker, lighter touch kind of projects that enable you to get value without a huge monolithic security review. We've done architecture reviews where you just have a rough sketch of what it is that you'd like to build before any of the pieces are filled in, and we can tell you the relative risk of doing so and the approach that you chose, whether it's gonna hold up uh, when we look at it months and months later. Um, we've also done just, you know, really quick scans over a code base, you know, eight hours at a time, it, it, it doesn't matter. So what I'd really say is just, if you're writing anything and you've got any kind of idea about what you're building, you should just reach out to a security firm like my own to, to double check your assumptions uh, whenever you feel comfortable. Thank you, and uh, you know, building on that, um, Jude McLean, you, you, know, you guys have gone through security assessments and you know, what are sort of like free recommendations in terms of do's for you know, anybody in the audience that is considering going through a, this process and on the other side of metal, what are some don'ts, some, some things that you would you know, recommend avoiding or doing differently from what you've done in the past? That Judy, if you wanna take it. Yeah, sure. Um, to elaborate more on Dan's point, uh, my first do is meet early and often with your auditors. Like there's, it's never too early to start thinking about how to write code securely, even from the design and whiteboarding standpoint. It's, or it's good to start thinking about that. So, but when you do start the formal process, like do things like meet with them once a day or, or open a Slack channel with them. Um, make sure that you're constantly talking with them because they're gonna have lots of surprising and interesting questions for you that um, will make you question how good your documentation really is because they will find holes in it and they will find holes, mismatches between the documentation and your implementation. And it's always good to get those answered and you know, brought to your attention sooner rather than later. And that leads into my next point. When, when problems are found, fix them fast. Fix them as fast as you can while still doing it safely. So at least that way, um, the, uh, if the, the auditor you're working with will be able to take a look at your fix as well and make sure that it addresses the, uh, the exploit that they discovered. And in the same vein, it's good to ask for a proof of concept of an exploit when appropriate. And my third do is, the third do in the things you should do is that you, when you get the report at the end, treat that as a starting point, not an ending point. It's not like a report card or an end of semester grade. It's, okay, here's some things that were found and this likely indicates there are other similar things that might be found later on. And of course, you know, do a second security review or a third security review and, and take the lessons learned from the nth minus first review and apply it to your nth review. Um, that said, on the, on the other side of the coin, uh, the don'ts, don't take it personally. Like as an engineer, like I don't like hearing about when someone finds bugs in my code, especially if they're stupid bugs. Like I, once, we, once we did an audit where we found a denial of service vulnerability because you could just open sockets and never close them and it would crash the node. I'm like, oops. So yeah, like don't take it personally. It, you'd rather hear about it from your auditors than from your users, or worse, from the attackers who are now demanding ransom for you to, them to stop attacking you. Um, 
Second, don't. Don't try to defend against literally everything. Like, there will come a point where there's just not worth it anymore. So think about your threat model. Like, make sure that your threat model makes sense and worry about defending against the adversaries you can defend against. Um, my third don't would be, don't forget the obvious things. So run static analyzers, run memory sanitizers. If you write in a memory unsafe language like C or C++, use Valgrind, seriously. Like, the, the, there, there, there's like the clever zero days that we all hear about that can bring networks to a sudden and surprising halt. And then there's, for every, every one of those, there's hundreds of stupid little things that you can catch pretty easily that can do just as much damage if left in the code base at production. So don't forget the obvious things. Thank you. Uh, McLean? Sure. I think uh, maybe three of the important things to keep in mind when you're doing audit is, is one, what the threat model is or what the scope of the audit is. <clears throat> so what are you trying to protect against? What are the particular attacks that you're especially concerned about? Um, and try to scope things out for the auditor pretty well and so that they're like, getting started, pointed in the right direction. Um, I think the second big thing to avoid is not to introduce sort of to the extent that you can, and obviously this goes back to the tension I talked about earlier, but to avoid introducing like major architectural changes or major changes to the code base in the middle of an audit. Um, obviously it's harder to hit a moving target, so this is gonna obviously slow the, the auditing firm down. Um, if you're sort of changing, you know, if they were looking at things, you know, one code base, you know, and they're halfway through it, it's all, all of a sudden they need to sort of review a huge chain set, um, obviously that's gonna decrease like the amount of um, valuable feedback that they're going to be able to provide. And then the final thing, and, and I think looking back at the audits that we've done, I think arguably the most important thing is to keep a really open line of communication uh, with the auditors during the audit. So I think the, the most successful or productive audits that we've done is we've literally had like a, a private Slack or Discord channel or some sort of uh, synchronous chat where we're sort of talking to the auditors almost daily as they're going through the code and looking at it. And that just makes the iteration time, like the feedback cycles a lot faster because if they have a question about something in the code or documentation or you know, need some sort of clarification, they can ask and immediately that question is answered as opposed to you know, you know, having like a, a once a week check-in or something like that and they're saving up all these questions for uh, a few days later. That's gonna obviously you know, slow things down. Um, and definitely like the, the least productive audits that we've had is when you know, we have like a kickoff call and then the auditors sort of disappear for a couple weeks and they come back you know, a month later with a report. Um, and you know, obviously if you're, you're not having any communication during the audit, like, you can kind of guess um, how productive that would be. Um, Dan, do you have anything else in terms of do's and don'ts to share from, from your perspective? Um, you know, what was something that well, uh, there's, been a pr there's been a couple of projects that we've worked on where people are hyper-concerned about, to, to give your perspective of scope and then also yours about um, kind of uh, remembering that there are multiple classes of things that can sink your ship. Uh, you know, w we've had clients come in with like novel consensus algorithms and these fantastically complicated systems and they want us to review those, but then it turns out that there's all these really fundamental kind of low-hanging fruit kinds of bugs that just immediately sink their ship and there's an unending, never-ending supply of them. And we can never get to like, you know, all, all the effort they spent in, on this fantastically complicated consensus algorithm will never actually pay off and turn into anything of value because the rest of the system that's holding it up is just a rotting piece of wood. Um, so yeah, we've had a lot of conversations like that with clients where we've had to refocus what they're concerned about um, and, and make sure they need to get the basics right before, they need to walk before they can run, right? And just to add on, you know, your experience having gone through so many of these projects, uh, you know, respecting, of course, the NDAs you guys have with clients, what was one finding that was particularly interesting that you would like to share with the audience, yeah. and what, what was the reaction from so, the project team? So nice try, I'm not gonna break any NDAs, but um, let, let, me, let me flip that a little bit, because it's never just about a single bug. Like, the fact that a, a, a particular project has a bug doesn't necessarily cause a ton of pain or consternation or, you know, a difficult chat with them. Usually it's because they ignored an entire class of bugs, a bug class, right? So the kind of bug class that I see a lot of blockchain projects ignoring um, at, at, their, at their own risk is uh, a lot of these delegate call-based smart contract upgrade systems 
where blockchain projects are betting their future on the correctness of a compiler with an awful history of security issues. Um, so that kind of thing ends up being much more difficult to back out because if it ever shows up in the future that, hey, we actually just fundamentally can't trust this entire ecosystem of tools that we've built upon, um, backing yourself out of it becomes extraordinarily challenging. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that we seek to identify on projects early, especially when we do architectural reviews. We have to very frequently talk people down from or back people out from a lot of low-level memory manipulation uh, when it comes to not just delegate call upgrades, but also things for the sake of speed that end up just inheriting a huge amount of risk that people are unaware of. Uh, so th th that's one thing that, you know, again, if you want to work with somebody early, you can ask for like, well, what are the largest number of foot guns present in my code base? Don't try and find any bugs. Just tell me, predict the future for me, and tell me where all the bugs are going to show up later. Um, and I will almost always tell you that it's going to be some low-level memory manipulation <laughs> uh, as like number one on the list. Thank you, Dan. And, uh, you know, Jude McLean, thinking about, you know, you've gone through several reviews. What was one finding that you can share with the audience that was particularly interesting from the security standpoint? And what was your reaction? What did you guys do um, once you heard about it? Um, so we... Um so just a little bit of disclosure, Prism actually gave an economic review of Blockstack earlier this year, and that was probably the most, the most interesting review I've ever done. Like most security audits we've done in the past have found things like, um, you know, denial of service vulnerabilities or incorrectness or those sorts of things. But the economic audit was really interesting because blockchains as a distributed system are differ, differ also from many other types of distributed systems in that they have an economic attack surface. Like, like people can follow your protocol perfectly correctly and not try to exploit it or cause crashes or do low level, mem low level memory manipulation. But just by taking certain, uh, doing certain activities in the protocol, like certain trades, they can still crash your network, but they don't have to do it by causing nodes to simply die or seg fault or anything. They can do it by making your, the ins they can do it by, uh, by breaking your incentive model and making it so nobody even wants to run a node in the first place. So it's, I think that that was probably our most interesting, most interesting audit just because it helped us uh, think about this new attack surface that we hadn't given as much thought as we should have earlier. McLean? Sure. So we've actually uh, published all of our security audits that we've gone through on our blogs. So if you're interested in like actually going through line by line and seeing you know, what types of things auditors tend to find, um, definitely feel free to go and check those out. But I think it's like, actually like, any instance of any particular bug is kind of less interesting or like the most value we've gotten out of some of the security audits have been the ones that are like a bit more consultative like Dan was talking about earlier with you know things like how you think about your um, contract upgrade approach um, and like the proxy pattern and delegate call obviously is a lot of different foot guns and like making sure that we're really putting the time and effort in up front to think through how we're going to deal with that um, as much as possible, so that you know we're not stumbling into one of these one of these foot guns. Um, I think that's from our perspective, like those types of um, reports and and feedback has, has been some of the most valuable. If I can just quickly yeah. add something on top of that, uh, one thing that we've done in the design of our upcoming blockchain stacks version two is we tried to learn from other companies' public security audits. I very much appreciate it when people make them public. Is more than just me that reads those? <laughs> of course. Life, life's too short. Life's way too short to repeat, to make all the mistakes yourself. You've got to learn from other people's mistakes, too. Um, so one thing we actually learned from this is don't have a compiler, period. Like, our smart contract language is the source is written directly to the chain itself and interpreted as opposed to their, thereby obviating the need for a compiler, and that's a whole class of bugs that get introduced by it. Uh, similarly, our system doesn't allow um, the normal types of, of dynamic dispatch that you would see in the EVM, but it requires something more akin to a uh, Node.js interface or a Rust trait, so you can know in advance what the implementation, the concretization is going to be of the code before it runs, thereby removing a whole ca another whole category of bugs that can hit, hit, that can hit smart contracts. Yeah, and um, to add on George's comment, life is never too short to read other people's security audits if you guys go on Trello Beats website, I'm gonna do a plug for Dan. Uh, they do have actually, I mean, I think it's a, like 20 or 30 different ones. Many, or many. Yeah, many, many. And you guys can actually read through, you know, what the analysis was, what was found. Uh, so 
uh, you know, if you're interested in learning for, you know, others' expenses, you know, there is a great resource out there that's freely available. Um, now, uh, switching a little bit gears towards, you know, the economic side of things. So we, we have talked about, you know, security audits, which have been a standard uh, for, for a long time. Um, economic audits are a little bit more recent. Um, then I wanted to get your take coming from the security side of things. Why do you think it's important to, you know, think about the, the economic implication? And, you know, you, you, you mentioned a few things in your, in your introduction, but, you know, you can expand on that. Um, yeah, sure. And just to follow up on that, so the, the reports are great. You can read the reports, but a lot of what we do is take the reusable knowledge from them and encode them into a machine-readable format in terms of our static, our static analysis systems, our property checking tools, our symbolic execution tools, because even for my own team, it doesn't make sense to have every new person I hire to go back and read every single report I've ever written in order to then become an expert again. Like, we have to be able to build on our previous expertise in a more efficient way, which is why we build tools, right? So that's why I try to hype them up so much and try to encourage people to use them, because they act you actually are standing on the shoulders of giants uh, when you're using them. Um, but yeah, so the economic stuff. I think there's this arbitrary cutoff where a lot of security folks stop and a lot of economists begin, and I think it's, uh, it, 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 we're all losing out because of that. Um, like the system is only, uh, like, we're trying to build systems that follow the developer's intentions. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that like checking for integer overflows or implementation issues is, is good enough for that. So it only makes sense, especially in a decentralized application where a lot of the security for decentralized applications is economic in nature to begin with. Like you have these proof of stake, proof of work systems with miners, like that's the underpinning of the system that we're trying to review for security at a higher level. It doesn't make sense to divorce those two things from each other. Um, a security firm can't just ignore the fact that all that exists while then looking at a bunch of solidity and, and, and trying to say, oh, that's not my problem. Um, so all these things are, are really more closely intertwined uh, than I think people have given enough credence to over the last year or two. Um, and I'm very excited to try and dig deeper into those specific like incentive and economic abuses that violate the intentions of an application without violating the, the rules that you've encoded into them. Um, I think that's part and parcel of, of what a security review should deliver. Thank you. Um, uh, Jude McLean, you know, both of your firms, full disclosure, you know, have gone through um, economic audits that, that we, we, we conducted. Um, but definitely, you know, you were early takers of, the, of this, um, you know, view of bringing economists in and reviewing what are the incentives for the stakeholders involved in your networks. Why did you decide that, you know, you wanted to go past just having a secure review and, and do an economic one as well? Well, to, just to build off of what Dan said, like these are, there's, there's no reason to stop at just the technical bits of the code. The system as a whole includes the um, economic actors who participate in the system and all the things that they can do, which in some which may or may not lead to your system uh, succeeding or failing. Um, so it was important for us to get this uh, checked out because we're in the process of building our own blockchain with our own smart contract platform on it. Um, it, it was highly beneficial for us to do so because it um, led to some pretty fundamental changes in our, our mint mechanism for minting new tokens. Um, we actually got it down, got it, it actually uh, got simplified as a result of the audit. We, we had a mechanism in place to um, address what we were worried about was a, uh, um, a, a vicious feedback loop whereby miners in the system could um, out, very quickly outprice um, smaller miners at a, at a rate that would leave them in control of the chain. And we built a mechanism that we thought would stop this, but upon further economic review of the system, it turned out that was not only unnecessary, but it would actually have hurt the chain's quality in the long run. So. And that's not something I could have caught because like, I'm a computer scientist, not an economist. I have a much harder time thinking about economics and the same goes for, I think, a lot of computer scientists. So having, having a set of eyeballs who are uh, far more knowledgeable on this than I could ever hope to be um, was super beneficial for us and we're already reaping those, those benefits right now. McLean. Yeah, I think the, the economics or are, are auditor are very interesting. Um, I mean, partly because it's, they're so new. Um, so it was, and for us, like, there's a few people on our team who have done security audits um, or have been auditors in the past. So going into a security audit, we kind of knew what to expect and, like, how it would work. 
Um, whereas with an economic audit, it was like a, you know, a little bit more of like a, an unknown. Um, so there was a lot of like interesting learnings for us, like when and, and how are, is it best to engage with an eco economic auditor. But I think that the big motivation for us to do an audit with PRISM was, um, you know, we can look at other, uh, internally, uh, we, we as uh, the team can look at other networks and try to learn from what they've done on the economic side. Um, you know, we can come to conferences like CESC and try to learn from, you know, practitioners and, and academics. Um, and do our best, but like fundamentally, none of us are economists. Um, so we thought it was very important for us to to engage with someone who does have that professional academic or scientific background in economics, um, not only to kind of identify maybe incorrect decisions that we've made, but also just to flag things that we hadn't even thought about at all. Um, you know, so we're sort of in the weeds of building a system. We're not thinking of it about it necessarily from the perspective of an economist, whereas someone who does have that background can bring this sort of more rigorous framework and apply that lens to all the things that we've uh, we've built, um, and that was, uh, I think, something that was, you know, very valuable that we certainly couldn't have done internally. Thank you. And maybe I'm going to add one note to that. Um, you know, again, economic artists are are relatively newer and, and more obscure. Um, I think what having gone through many on our side. Uh, one interesting aspect, building on McLean's point of like sort of pointing at things that the team has even thought of. Um, you know, one key part of an economic audit is uh, what we call an economic map of the system, which means, you know, taking in all the information in the documents that the client provide and getting through a number of calls, you know, what are the objectives, and then, you know, mapping it, translating to economics. So what, what is actually happening, what are the transactions, what are the stakeholders, and then, uh, related to that, there is a gap analysis, so highlighting what is actually missing. Uh, and it's interesting that often there are things missing that, again, the, the, the team has never even thought of it, their existence because um, uh, ultimately, it's a, you know, building on Jude's point, it doesn't matter how smart of a computer scientist one is, it's simply that this specific knowledge uh, is very, you know, field of knowledge is just different from what your base is. So uh, you would sort of like need a different set of glasses to see the problem and you just don't have those glasses. So that's, that's I think, a, like a key point that, uh, that I wanted to highlight. Now, um, then um, um, I know we have a few minutes and I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions, uh, but you know, eh? yeah, yeah. So um, I know, you know, we, we have been talking, uh, the, our two firms for a while and um, you know, we have thought that it would be interesting to have um, security people and economies working together, and I wanted to, you know, know from you what, what you thought about that, and, you know, maybe we have a little thing to share with the audience <laughs> on this front. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think what Trail of Its is ultimately about is correctness, and expanding our view of what correctness is for a system is only going to help us. So by incorporating more of that economic knowledge into the model that we use to review your code, you're just going to get better output out the other end. So to give you an example, um, you might be developing some kind of auction, and we find transaction reordering issues with it where certain people can cut in line. Uh, Guido finds issues with uh, price discovery. And now your team is left with the problem of creating a system that solves not just the issues that I found, but the issues that he found, and, and you're kind of left with uh, an open question of how that gets done. So by putting the two of our heads together, I think we're in a much better position to help you figure out what the solution to that looks like. Um, on the other hand, I, I also think that when you're consulting with teams, um, there's a lot of high-level analysis about what the economic system should look like, and I think Trail of Bits can help bridge the gap in terms of, at a low level, how is the code written to adhere to the recommendations that PRISM has made? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for reusing security tools for economic analysis and for proving that markets work the way that you think they do. Um, so overall, I think this has been a really fantastic journey that we've been on. You know, I, I've shadowed a few of your projects, you've shadowed a few of my projects, and it's incredible how we work in such similar ways. Um, but we're really only at the beginning of this, and I think that as time goes on, we're going to find a lot more value that we can extract from putting an economist and a security expert in a room at the same time. 
Thank you, Dan. Um, Jude McLean, do you have like um, some views on you know having security and economic people working together during assessments? I mean, I, I think it's you know the the sum is greater than the parts here. There's there's a whole universe of interesting interesting uh, ways this could go uh, research wise. Just looking at the how, how uh, security can be thought of from both a, a technical perspective as well as an economic perspective. And I don't even think it's specific to blockchains necessarily, although blockchains are an immediate application. I think this also goes for online games that have in-game economies. There's certainly um, behavioral, there, there's behavioral properties of the actors in that system that are a function of things like the in-game in -game currency or items. Um, another example, um, would be like peering agreements between autonomous systems and the internet. Like the routes you announce are a function of the peering agreements that you have and the dollars for the, the dollars per bit that you're spending with your upstream neighbors and your downstream neighbors. And both of these areas, I think, are highly technical systems that also have very um, elaborate economics that um, interplay with the behavior of these systems. So, like future research into into the how uh, into the economic facet of the overall security of these systems, I think is going to be something that we see in the future a lot more. Thank you. McLean? Yeah, and, and obviously like at IndieCypher, we've gone through both types of audits independently. Um, I do think the idea of, of combining them in, in some way makes a lot of sense and is pretty, very interesting, especially if you think about like, you know, if you're a security auditor um, and you're auditing the code and then the economic auditor basically recommends the project to redesign sort of maybe the some particular mechanism design or the entire incentive system. Um, obviously, like, if the auditor, security auditor has already reviewed a lot of that code and it's getting thrown out, like, that's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of wasted work. Um, so I can see a lot of value on, on that front. And then on, on, on another front, like, when the economic auditor perhaps recommends a, a particular redesign or recommends the addition of something, sort of having the security auditor um, to sort of lend their expertise as well can help you figure out like, okay, is this recommendation feasible or, or what's like the best way to go about actually implementing that uh, in code? Thank you. Um, so just to add to Dan's point, uh, uh, we don't have the announcement ready yet, uh, but as he mentioned, we have been shadowing each other's team for now many months. We've gone through four, three, four projects. Four. Uh, for, yeah, and uh, we're going to be announcing soon uh, a joint offering uh, from our two firms, uh, really combining many of the things that we have mentioned over this panel. So, you know, look out for the announcement. <laughs> uh, now, we have uh, just a few minutes left, and I wanted to get a few questions from the audience, if there are questions. Um, so uh, maybe if you can, you know, just raise your hand and identify you, who you are, and, you know, um, I, we can, I don't know if we have an extra mic for questions, but... Um, any any question from the audience? I can be a runner. Yeah, we. <laughs> Nobody wants to harass me. Oh, all right, we have one over there. So the, the question was, I, I made the point earlier, um, the difference between, there's not really a, a way to distinguish in blockchains between outright intentional fraud or unintentional bug or mistake. And the question was, um, we had to deal with this in real life already. And how do we intend to deal with it in the future as blockchains become more prominent? Is that accurate to the system? Life, there's, there's, you, you don't go to economics, you don't go to security, you have to go to court and you sue yeah. each other. Because auction went bad for telecom spectrum. And somebody decides who's bad, who's good, where's the white hat, the black hat, and the assigns punishments and sanctions and sorts it. Precisely. You don't have that mechanism yet, so you may need more than just economics. Oh yeah, certainly. Like the you raise an excellent point. Like the, the way we deal with this in the real world is we don't go to the security auditors or the economists, we go to the courts and we sue each other and we figure it out and the judge <laughs> issues a ruling. Uh, blockchains unfortunately don't have courts and blockchains are peer networks that um, run in many different legal jurisdictions and even determining, like con consider, consider your favorite um, uh, smart contract hack, like let's just talk about the DAO or something like that. Who's at fault? 
like everyone's peer executed the transactions in every single jurisdiction that led to the alleged fraud. Um, so even if we could identify the person or, or people who did that, how do we even choose which jurisdiction we sue them in? Um, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know how to answer that question, and I don't know how to turn this into an algorithm either, and I'm not even sure it'd be wise to try. Um, I think that it it's a, makes the system more risk averse, for sure, and I think that it's um, up to developers to create um, smart contract libraries and smart contract platforms and also smart contracts themselves that um, minimize that risk to the best of their ability to do so. Uh, like one thing that we're doing at Blockstack, for example, is we're making it so that when you send a transaction, you have a set of post conditions at the end of that transaction that must all be true about the state of your account after the transaction runs. And if they're not true, the transaction aborts and you're just out your transaction fee. The reason we do that is because it gives users a way to proactively defend themselves against um, smart contracts that don't behave the way you think they behave, be it due to fraud or be it due to negligence or something else. That's the best I got for you on the courts. Thank you. Uh, any, we have time for a couple more questions. There's uh, one in the back first, I think, this is the gentleman there. Well, what's the difference between auditing a smart contract for economic and security issues? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so I'd say historically people are looking at technical correctness of the code. They're making sure that certain invariants aren't uh, like broken about the code that, you know, I'll, I'll just harp on this integer overflow thing or that it doesn't have re-entrancy problems and that uh, like as data passes around that like it, it, it's doing what you tell it to uh, and that you can trust that the code operates in production the way that your developer had in their head. Um, however, with an economic audit, I think the perspective is a bit different. You want to? Yeah, on, on the economic side, um, you know, you think about, you know, what are the incentives of people using the smart contract, but you think about it in the broader sense of what is the outcome. It's always like, what's the outcome that the team has for the system in mind? And is this smart contract, can it be used to achieve a different outcome, right? And if it's so, like, you know, is it because they're going to game the system a certain way? So it's not about... The code running correctly is how does the design react versus the preferences and the constraints that different stakeholders have as they interact with the system and can it lead to an outcome that is not what you want as a team and if so, like how do you change the mechanism so that you go towards your outcome, right? So that's why um, I think it's important to consider that um, an economic review is always very context specific. So we always need to understand what is the goal for your particular project that you want to achieve, and maybe the recommendation is actually going to be quite different, even if the technical correctness is, is the same, right? So that's... So the shortest way to describe this, I think, is that for me, it's the code does what you says it, says it does. And for him, it's maybe I didn't want that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, oh, okay. Very good. I feel like this is a question for the bar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let, uh, we, let's we, handle this in front of some drinks outside. We, we, we do have another question. Just want to make sure that. Yeah, um, so when you, when you think about it, and I think some were mentioning the earlier presentation that Stephanie gave, but you think about, um, you know, we, we categorize economic failures in different buckets, and um, it really um, depends on what is, what, how, so, so let me give you a couple of examples, right? So uh, one could be uh, innocuous or malicious game, gaming of the system, right? So I can... Uh, every time in a system you produce, uh, you, you provide subsidies, so you're paying some people to do certain actions, they could find a way to qualify for the subsidies without doing the underlying action or, or faking it in a way. And, and you know, the example that 
a classic example we use in more traditional economics is the, the famous Wells Fargo, you know, the employees opening fake accounts, qualifying for the year bonus, but Wells Fargo wasn't making any more revenues and they actually had to pay $600 million of, of fines. Another type of failures that we see are um, free riding. So uh, you see participants adopting a network and they do get the benefit without actually having to contributing. Uh, but actually there's also another type of failure which is often confused for free riding, which is um, um, uh, basically users enter the network and they perceive that their contribution is not gonna pay, be paid off enough, so there's too much risk. And this is a failure of the information of the system. So basically, you set up everything correctly, you're just not letting the user know that they're gonna get paid for whatever action, so they're all sort of paralyzed. And it looks like they're you know, just static and kind of free riding on the system, but it's not an intentional failure uh, from the user perspective. Again, we have many other categories um, so yeah, we, we go through this, um, uh, and, and again, it's always extremely context specific to what the goals of the system are. Uh, so it might be that similarly similar system from a technical standpoint will be subject to different type of economic failures. So, uh, so unlike uh, unlike uh, the uh, library well, that the Cholobits has, uh, uh, for uh, certain reasons, uh, none of the several um, reports that we've made have been made public yet. Uh, I can say there is one project that might soon. Uh, unfortunately, we can you know with most kinds actually we we, we cannot even mention who they are. Uh, I think it's uh, the the. the the issue that I do see uh, from an economic artist standpoint that some of the, the, the issues that we, we point are very fundamental and they need time to actually redesign entire parts. So it's not like fixing a bug, oh, I, I'm publishing the security because I fixed it already. Here we are talking, okay, I have to redesign this mechanism. Uh, maybe I'm not gonna disclose this to the world until this is done. Uh, so people should sign up to your newsletter before then, because that's the primary method that you export your knowledge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do encourage, I mean, we do, so we do share in an anonymized version findings every month in our newsletter that I invite to sign up. So we try as much as possible to, uh, to do that, but uh, yeah, without naming anybody to respect people's NDA. Um, I think time is up. I don't know if there's any final questions, but otherwise we're just going to wrap it here. Thank we'll, you, everyone. We'll be around. Say hi. Yes. Thanks.